Good morning, church. Hey, why don't we stand together and lift our praise to the Lord in this place today. Sing with us. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. He won't fail me. I'm so glad that you're here to worship today. This morning, I'm in Indianapolis at the General Assembly of the Church of the Nazarene, worshiping with 20,000 Nazarenes from all across the world. And all of the BFC pastors are here with me too. But not to worry, because you're in great hands this morning. My good friend, Pastor Scott Kelly, who I worked with in Cincinnati, is here to lead you in worship through music. And many of you know and love Pastor Timmy Riggs. He'll be preaching from God's Word today. So I welcome all of you with God's grace and peace this morning, and I'm excited to hear about how God moves among you. I'm joining you online as we worship together and focus on God's Word. Well, good morning. I'm Scott Kelly. Thank you for the privilege of allowing me to lead you in worship this morning. Do you know how blessed you are to have Pastor Rick as your senior pastor? I love my family and I, we love Pastor Rick and Annette. And your, uh, your worship pastor is not too shabby either. He's, he's pretty great as well. I love Nick. And uh, uh, this morning as we gather in worship, 
Uh, Pastor Nick is leading thousands and thousands of Nazarene that come from across the globe in worship in Indianapolis, Indiana. And isn't it cool to think that we get to join our voices with theirs and offer up praise to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in this place here today? More sobering than that is the fact that we get the opportunity to join the saints and the angels around the throne of God. So I'm gonna invite you to stand together this morning and we're gonna sing a refrain that's being echoed in heaven right now around his throne. A song you know well. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty.
You are the Lord of Lords. Sing that third verse again. Can you sing with me? Sing. Holy, 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 the man has fallen from thee, but through the blood of Christ thy Son, this soul can be redeemed. Justice. that he's a savior of sinners, don't you? I've often heard it said that we should praise him. We should will ourselves to praise him until worship begins to happen. And then when worship begins to happen, we should worship him until his glory fills this place. And then we simply just get to bask in his glory. This morning, his glory has filled this place through our praise and through our worship. So we sing to him, how great is our God, sing this with me, sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Sing that again, church, him on this side of the cross, on this side of Calvary, where we know the redemptive power of his saving grace in our life. We know of his goodness and his mercy. And the Bible tells us that that goodness and that mercy follows us as all the days of our life. And so we can't help this morning to sing of his goodness in this place.
pray with me quick. God, uh, I'm thankful for this morning. I'm thankful we get to come together and uh, just kind of recognize that your smile and the aim of your face is in our direction. And uh, we're thankful for that. Also want to lift up our team, our, our pastoral team is there at General Assembly. We're excited for them. And uh, as everybody, all 20,000 people uh, travel back to their states and countries, we ask uh, that you're with them protect them, keep them safe, and uh, thank you for everybody who helped make today happen. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, hey, take a seat. Turn to your neighbor real quick, because I need some time, and tell them that you like their shirt. You like the color of their shirt. Marla, I like your green shirt. Looks good. Good job, Scott. Hey, so I'm talking about General Assembly. Maybe today uh, you're in here and this is the first time you have ever come to church with us, hung out with us, and you're like, I don't know what you're talking about. That's all right. We uh, have, our church is called the Church of the Nazarene. We are part of a much bigger movement. There's actually two million people involved in our denomination all across the globe. Really exciting. Every four years we get together and uh, talk about some, some matters and we vote on things, but really just to encourage us. And uh, so that's what's happening right now in Indiana, as Pastor Rick said. And so we're really thankful for that. But also, a lot had to happen for today to still kind of happen. And so all the production team, all the worship team, so many different volunteers have stepped up and stepped in. So can you just give them a hand real quick? Let them know you're thankful for them. They did so good. We, uh, we have been going through a series called You From God's View. We're not in the series anymore, but I wanted to, to add to it, okay? And so the bottom line is, Pastor Rick has been leading us in the direction of saying, look, we have been given a gift. It is a gift that makes our life full and abundant, right? We believe that God can do things beyond anything we can dream or imagine, and we're not to just hide that gift. Jesus says, look, when the kingdom breaks in, you don't go bury it in the yard, you share it for everyone. And so he's leading us in the direction of saying, we want to reach as many people as possible for this kingdom, for this gift, and we're gonna uh, begin to do our best to reach 500 people over the next couple of years. Uh, and it's not just to boost stats, it's to actually see change in people's lives. And at the end of the day, we're hoping for even more than that. So that's where I'm gonna pick up 
Today, we are gonna be in Luke 22. And at first, you might be like, that is not a very joyful passage. And you're right, I'm usually the joyful guy. We will get there throughout the service, okay? So uh, Luke 22, let me find it here. Verse 54 through 62, you can uh, read in your Bible, you can read it off your phone, or you can follow along on the screen. There it is. Jesus has been with the disciples tonight. It's towards the end of his three-year mission. He told them what was about to happen. He then uh, goes to the garden to pray, and this is where we pick up. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Now, I just wanna note in the other gospels, uh, they escalate Peter's aggression. He, his denials get more aggressive and uh, more frustrated. Luke is like, hey, the denials are bad enough, so we'll just leave it at that, all right? He denied her. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. And about an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. We will get to a place where this is actually encouraging and not as sad as Peter just going out and weeping bitterly. God, thank you for this passage. Uh, I've worked hard, I've prepared, but at the end of the day, it's, it's gonna come up short. And so I just ask that you speak and touch the hearts in this room that you need to. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, the stats are in, folks, and it's not looking good in my direction, Okay. As a 30-year-old man with a family and a slight ACL tear, there is basically 0% chance that the NFL is drafting me anytime soon, okay? It makes sense right now. You're like, yeah, that makes sense, look at you. But I thought as I was growing up in life that maybe there was a small chance, okay? Uh, There was still 0% chance most of my life. Look at me, all right? Uh, I'm not very tall, not very big. Like, I was built to run 100 miles at a time. Not play in the NFL. But when I was in kindergarten, I was sitting there with my dad, hey, who seemed like a giant to me, right? When you're little, you think everyone is so big. As I grew older, I was like, oh my goodness, he's a very meek, mild, gentle, small man, right? Like, it's your fault I didn't make it to the NFL, dad. And so I'm sitting with him in kindergarten and we're watching these gladiators on TV, man. They were just so big. They were doing amazing things that you knew were hard and they were making it look easy and everybody was cheering for him, was excited. And I was like, sign me up. I want to be one of those guys. And so he signs me up, and I am a lion peewee. I'm five years old. I got a picture of me right here. There I am. Okay, Pastor Rick typically would show you Sadie. I don't have a grandkid, so you get to see me. I, ha- I take a couple issues at this picture because someone should have told my parents it was irresponsible to allow me to get on the field. Those shin guards are my knee pads, okay? They're not supposed to be down there. I'm swimming in those shoulder pads. It's probably the smallest ones they had. That's a peewee football. Look at my little tiny, pure little hand, okay? I can't even hold the ball well. There's no chance that I should have been on the field. It's a miracle that I'm alive, okay? So the first day of practice, we're out there, and uh, I wasn't very big, so I'm not a lineman. I wasn't the coach's son, so I didn't get to play quarterback. I didn't have any skill. And all you do is run the ball, so I wasn't going to be running back. So the coach sticks me what I feel like is a mile away from the play, all right? And so I'm over here, and he says, when the play happens, you do nothing. You stand there, and you watch the play. And I was like, okay, that's not what they do on TV. And he was like, we're not going to throw the ball yet. we got some more to learn. The kid on the other side, his coach clearly was better than him, right? Because he says, hey, when the play gets snapped, I want you to run at that other kid as hard as you can, and with the top of your helmet, hit him right under the chin. That's exactly what happened to me, okay? Fall back, looking up at the skies, immediately burst into tears, all right? Zero shame. I sit up, I find my dad in the crowd of people, and I said, Dad, I quit. I don't want to play this game no more. 
And I got up and I walked over to him and I'm not embarrassed because I don't want to get hurt anymore. But I know he probably was, you know, he's going to take off the pads. He's like, he's not actually my kid. I don't know who's, right? And he had to turn in my pads. I figured I needed a good rest before I signed up for the next season. So I didn't play again until my senior year of high school. <laughs> what I lacked in commitment, size, and uh, really just skill in general, I made up for in confidence, okay? And I wanted to play quarterback. I told the coach that, and I ended up doing it. Just some weird events happened. All the other guys got hurt. And uh, I was like, that's it. I love playing quarterback. Quarterbacks get the girls. They get the glory. That's the type of player I want to be. So I come out to SNU because I was like, that's the best place to get seen by the scouts. All right, a small, private Christian university in the middle of Oklahoma City. And so I come out, and the first day of two-a-days, I realized that, oh my goodness, my dreams have been misplaced because everybody is bigger and faster and just better than me, okay? And so when you are six-string quarterback, you don't get invested by the coaches. And so at practice, like, they didn't really need me. They were like, honestly, it'd be better if you weren't here. So I just went and uh, hung out with the kickers, all right? And in fact, uh, one game, I took it so unseriously that I was like, guys, I'm going to go pick a jersey uh, from the locker room. Let me find one. So I think we have a jersey right here. Look at that. First of all, look at that hair. Not a lack of discipline in that young man. Uh, Let's do the side-by-side, side because once I found both these pictures, I was like, look at the jersey number, guys. I was never destined to play in the NFL. Now, I'm hanging out with the kickers. Here's what's crazy. I was actually pretty good at it. I was kicking 35, 40, 45, 50-yard field goals. One of my best friends who actually played quarterback at SNU is sitting right over here. He can oblige. He'll tell you that I was actually pretty good at it. For whatever reason, not a mentor or adult in my life was taking notice because no one was like, hey, buddy, you can't see over the offensive line, so you probably shouldn't play quarterback. But you are a pretty good kicker. Put your time and effort into that, right? But instead, no one told me that. And I just thought, oh, like I want to play quarterback. My point is, I wanted you guys to know I played sports, okay? <laughs> but also, it wasn't that I wasn't an athlete. It wasn't that I actually didn't want to work hard and be good at something. It's just that the whole time I was in the wrong position. I had the wrong role, right? It's not the wet thing I was built for. You just look at me, it makes sense. When I'm like, yeah, I was pretty good kicking field goals, like none of you gasped, you know? You were like, makes sense. And so I was just in the wrong spot. In life, we know that we have all types of positions and roles that we play. Some are temporary and some are permanent, but there's all types of different things, right? And so I'm not even gonna tarry on it. We all know uh, that some of us, once we find what we're good at, what our giftings are, that man, life comes a little bit smoother than when we're trying to fit ourselves into a box that we don't fit. In our Christian faith, it is uh, much the same way. God has called us, destined us to be a part of his inbreaking kingdom, but we have a position to play. We have a role for us to live into. And when we do it right, we get to live the kind of words that Jesus shares with us in Matthew where he just says, hey, walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. I won't lay anything heavy on you. In fact, I want to teach you how to live freely and lightly. I think we walk in these doors today, every one of us is going to be like, yeah, I, I would love to live a little lighter. And I'm not talking about weight. I'm just talking about our soul. I'd love to live a little bit freer. And when we're in the right position, we can experience that. But when we're, we're, in, we're out of the right position, life becomes a lot harder. There's a lot more striving, a lot more effort. This past week, uh, I was really getting ready for you guys because I spoke six times at a camp, okay? At the end of it, I'm like, guys, I got nothing else to say to you, all right? Like, you have heard my voice uh, just as much as my wife, and so at this point, you're probably tired of me. But I was there, and the third night, uh, a guy comes up to me. His name is Michael, and he was like, hey, Timmy, I just want to let you know. I know you're here for the students, but you've, you've been speaking to me. And I was like, I am but a humble servant, okay? And I was like, but what's your favorite part? Right, And so we're sitting there and we're talking and uh, it, I really was like, hey, thank you, it means a lot. And he was like, bottom line is this, I could tell he was late 30s and he started telling me that about three years ago, he doesn't know how to explain it, but basically him and his wife, they were on the path to divorce. His relationship with his kids were strained. They had a lot of kids. He had a good job, good paying job, but uh, he wasn't satisfied there. They didn't have any church community. 
They had no relationship with God. Um, they were just going nowhere fast, he said. And life was miserable. And he doesn't know how to explain it other than it was a Saul-Paul encounter with Jesus. He said, man, I was just driving home one day. I don't know if I accidentally turned on worship music or what, but God was just like, hey, Michael, I'm not done with your life. I have a plan for you. Your marriage isn't over. Your relationship with your kids is gonna get restored. Just start following me. And he was like, it was the craziest thing. I mean, he's telling me this, and he's got tears in his eyes, folks. And so I'm like, man, this is the real deal. And he's so excited about it. And so I was like, man, that's awesome. And he tells his wife and he was like, a few weeks went on and we were already starting to see some changes. We were doing the little things that we knew to do. And that was like listening to worship music, reading some books, watching some people on YouTube. He was like, but I knew we needed to get plugged into a community that made it clear from all the things that we were kind of consuming. And so uh, I told my wife that I was going to go to the church that we pass on our way home. And sure enough, it's a Nazarene church, but he didn't know that any about that, about any of that stuff when he went there. And so he goes there and he knocks on the door and he tells the pastor, hey, this is my story. I'm just so grateful for what God's doing. I know I'm still not doing it all right. I'm not saying all the right things and, and I'm not doing all the right things, but, I, but I'm just believing that God is, is transforming my life. And uh, the pastor is, oh, that's amazing. And he was like, look, um, I don't know what else to do. I just want to give back. And so let me come to the church on Saturday and clean the windows. And I was like, you're kidding me. And he was like, no, seriously. And I was like, for free? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, you're doing it wrong. I could teach you. And I was like, man, you should have picked something easier, Michael. And he was like, yeah, I just, I just wanted to give back. And he goes, uh, or I said to him, I was like, you're lucky I wasn't the pastor. Because if I was, I'd have been like, oh, Michael, God is definitely speaking to you, but I think he has more to say. We've got some leaky toilets back here. And I think if you listen to him, it'd be a great time, right? I'm sitting there talking with Michael and I'm so encouraged. I'm just like, man, yes, that's what it's like. And, and I don't know, some of you, you guys are like me, you're lifers, right? And on my way to becoming a pastor, you have to fill out all this paperwork and it's like, when was your conversion? And I was like, um, when I was conceived? I don't know, like, all I know is God and the church. I've spent more time there than the pews did. Like, I've always loved the Lord. Yes, I've had shaky moments, but he's always been in my life. But for someone like Michael, he's like, no, no, I lived a life completely separate from God. And when I met God, I couldn't get enough of it. And all I wanted to do was just be around him. So some of our, us lifers, like we get in our own routine, but also maybe you got saved early in life and now some time has gone on, right? And him and I were talking, we were talking about my favorite hymn, uh, Jesus Paid It All. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, no, I'm just kidding, I just keep going. Uh, we, we buy into that and we hear that song and even hearing it right there, you're like, man, yeah, that is true, right? Jesus did pay it all and he did, he did clean my sin away. And that was kind of the stuff that Michael kept saying, like certain shame and unforgiveness. He was like, literally, I wasn't even trying and it just started to go away. It was amazing what God was doing and that's how we can be. But some time can go on and we sing that song, but now, oh, I got a, I got a little bit of a spill. I got a new stain and I don't want God to get upset with me. So I'm going to do the best that I can in my own performance to try to clean it. Right. And other people see us trying to clean our stains and then we can get real good at getting together and be like, hey, we're going to talk about what it looks like to clean our stains. Carol's not here this week, but have you seen her stains lately? I'll tell you what, she's got some work to do, right? And so we begin to be at the spot where, yes, we believe that Jesus saved us, but now it is up to me to sustain myself and sustain my faith and sustain my relationship with God. And so we put ourselves in a position that we were never created to be. And we get really tired and we get worn out and it becomes actually really easy to uh, allow pride and boasting and different things like that to seep into our life when we're the ones that think, I'll sustain it, I'll clean the stains. For Peter, uh, we know that it's a sad situation. But what gets him to this point, right? We kind of got to rewind. It's like there's a clip here where he's like, how did I get here? Let me show you, right? Jesus shows up and he's preaching the kingdom of God has come near. He says, repent and believe the good news. We know that Peter, in another story, uh, does decide to drop everything and follow Jesus, probably because he heard words similar to those from Jesus. The kingdom of God has come near. 
for Peter and all the other Jews, this is not new information. This is something they were hoping for, expecting. They don't have to have someone explain to them what kingdom means. For the Jews, they were God's chosen people. They were led out of uh, slavery in Egypt, then to their promised land, only then to fall to the oppressive hands of the Babylonians, the Persians, and now Rome. But through the prophets, God has promised that their kingdom would be restored, that their status would be up amongst with the power of all the other nations. And so they have been looking and hoping and believing that there is a new king to lead them to just that finished product. And they understand it just as they would understand King David. Okay, he's gonna come in and this kingdom is gonna be set right by might. So for Peter, yes, he's seeing miracles. He's seeing the things that Jesus is doing. And he's a little like, well, that's not quite how I expected it. But he is also hopeful and believing for it to be a kingdom like they have been promised. And it doesn't hurt if you're the guy who helps Get the king on his throne, right? Because you're probably gonna be standing right next to him, giving a cheese to all the people. And so Peter is doing a lot of things in his power to try to make sure he can help Jesus get where he's supposed to go, but also prove to Jesus, hey, I'm worth being the guy who's gonna be on your right hand. And so when they're at dinner and it's the end of the ministry, Jesus' ministry, and he's trying to tell them what's happening, he says, guys, uh, tonight it's gonna be tough. Um, one of you is gonna betray me and all of you are gonna scatter. Now, Peter does what it's easy for us to do and we can start looking around and thinking, no, 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 not me. And we can allow our pride, our Christian pride, thinking, yes, I I'm here to serve you, Jesus. I wanna show you how good I'm doing. Uh, we can stand up like Peter sometimes and he stands up and he says, hey, Jesus, all these other losers can leave you, uh, not me. I will not. I will go with you all the way to the throne, but if we don't make it that far, I will die with you. If that's what I need to do, that's what I am willing to do. And Jesus is looking around, and this, this is probably a pretty tough moment because he's like, oh, Peter, uh, that's not gonna happen. In fact, before the sun comes up and before the rooster crows three times, you are gonna deny me. I can't imagine the pain that Peter probably felt, but he was like, man, I'm, I'm gonna prove you wrong, Jesus. And so they go out to the garden and they're praying and uh, Peter is still thinking, no, 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 I'm not gonna let it happen this way. We have a plan. You're the king. You need to be on the throne. I'm gonna prove to you my worth. So they're sitting there and Judas and the other people come to arrest Jesus. And here's what Peter does. Uh, he whips out his sword. Now I wanna point something out. Peter was a fisherman and... He was a missionary, whether he realized it or not. He was not a master swordsman. So when he cuts the dude's ear off, it's not because he's like, get back, or I'll cut the other one off. He's trying to kill the dude. Peter misses, okay? He wasn't a good swordsman. He is passionate about helping Jesus get where he's supposed to go, and he's adamant about Jesus seeing that Peter's doing what he's supposed to be doing. But here's the thing, Peter even though he wasn't truly a willing to die for Jesus, he was willing to kill for him. And Jesus is like, but that is not my kingdom. You've seen that from the kingdoms of the world, but that is not the type of kingdom that I am breaking in now. Peter, those that live by the sword, die by the sword. Jesus gets arrested, they go to the courtyard. Peter follows in the distance, and that is where we see Peter deny Jesus three times, okay? Uh, I think it's important to note, we, we do not believe this way anymore. Uh, it's not the way that our society and culture has been set up, but at this time, uh, they had like caste systems, and they had different standards for who was on uh, above who, right? And so uh, it, it was men, women, servants, all just a list of different ways. And we see that the first person to ask Peter if he was with Jesus, is a servant girl, which is to say, one of the people who are on the bottom of society, Peter can't even get the goal and the gumption to say, yeah, that's my friend. And so what happens when we stand up with, with, with Christian pride is often the blow is pretty tough and pretty hard because at the end of the day, we're never gonna measure up to what we think we can. 
And so Peter's there, and the third time he denies him. And I think uh, it's interesting because the other gospels don't necessarily note this, but Luke does. And that is the third time that Peter denies Jesus, Jesus turns and looks straight at Peter, catches him right in the eyes. There's a lot going on here. But in the Old Testament, the glory of God, uh, it would just kill you. There are stories where someone like Moses was gonna have an interaction with God and God says, hey, your sin, my glory, they can't go together. Uh, you would die. So I need you to turn your back from me so that way when I pass by, you won't get obliterated because I'm just too good. And then there's also parts where Israel is not doing what they were meant to be doing and, and they're living outside of God's will. This is in Isaiah and uh, they're living a life of sin and God says, look, I cannot be in connection with your sin so I am gonna turn my face from you. It's just the way it is. But we're stepping out of the old covenant and into the new covenant. And now God, he, he is making a path in the wilderness. He is making rivers in the desert. He is pouring new wine into new wineskin. And he has come to earth in the manifestation of Jesus Christ. He's put on skin and bone. And that's what we call the incarnation. And so now God's glory is put into human form. And so what happens to Peter in the midst of his sin? Because I don't know how to call it anything else. If I stood up here and told you that I'm denying Jesus, you're going to be like, yeah, that's pretty clear. Maybe not as bad as Judas, but it's right under it. And so in Peter's sin, where is the face of God? Aimed right at Peter. What's going on here? When I look at, at this word, uh, it says Jesus looked at Peter. It's the same word that John describes the first interaction that Jesus and Peter ever have. It's the same word. And it's the same word that is described to uh, Peter, or I'm sorry, Jesus and Paul's encounter on the road to Damascus. It's the same exact word. And that word there is not a look of disappointment because it's easy for me to think that because I'm human and I'd be disappointed. Is Jesus hurt? Yeah, no doubt. This is a painful couple days for him. But he's not looking at Peter with condemnation. That word there would have meant a word of intimacy. It would have meant a word of connection. And so in the middle of Peter's sin, the look that he gets from God is a look of compassion. We get ourselves in a place where I'm positioned and saved by God, but now it is up to me and I better figure it out. And so now that I have sinned and I've figured out my sin, I am terrified to even look in the direction of God because I know he is gonna be angry and there's gonna be judgment. And I don't even wanna talk to anyone else around me because I'm gonna get the same thing from them. But in fact, Jesus is saying, no, 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 Peter, look at me. Why? He's saying, look, Pete, I'm not sitting here thinking, oh, you know what, God? Do you see the conditions you're making me work under? These guys aren't standing by my side. Let, time out. Let's start over. Let me pick a new team. No. And he's not looking at Peter and saying, oh, Pete, I even told you, man. We knew this was going to happen. I gave you a chance. No, it's not disappointment. He's looking at him and he's not surprised. And in fact, he's saying, Peter, I'm not going to the sin. I'm not going to the cross despite your sin. I'm not still mustering up the effort to do it, even though you sin. I'm going to the cross for your sin. It's a big difference. And so what happens for Peter and what I think that we can remind ourselves of, okay, Jesus saved me, but he's also the sustainer of my life, which is a reminder that I don't have any room to really boast about what God is doing in my life when it comes to look at my efforts and look where I am, look how far I've come, if I'm not pointing back to him. Because the only contribution that I have made to the saving grace of Jesus Christ is my sin. That's why he went to the cross. So he's not sitting here giving Peter a look of condemnation and frustration, but one of, I'm still gonna do what the will of Father will of the Father has on my life, and I'm going to the cross. Now, Peter uh, obviously still has a restorative and redemption moment in his life, but can I add that it's all because of Jesus? Jesus is the one that comes to him after the resurrection and is the one that initiates and engages, which is to say that it is all God. It's all the grace of God in our life. Our salvation and our walking with him, our transformation, our sanctification, pull out every theological word you know, it's God. That's the point. So what do we do with this news? 
How do we live our life and how do we move forward? And how we say, okay, God, I've got one position and it is to recognize that in my highs and in my lows, your face is aimed at me and you're telling me to look back at you and recognize everything that you have done. Where do we go from here? How do we help break your kingdom in? I love uh, Romans 14, 17 through 18. Paul is saying, hey, the kingdom of God, it's not a matter of eating and drinking. He's talking about the customs, the Jewish customs, the traditions, the way of the law. He said, look, that's not how we get there anymore. And don't get me twisted, by the way, like I, I am pro self-discipline. I am pro growth. I am pro transformation and I am pro practices within a church community. But the means of those are to help us see Jesus and the fact that he's looking at us. Not to make me feel good about how many days in a row I've done this or that. It's always to get us to the place of Jesus. And so Paul is saying, here's what kingdom's got, kingdom of God is about. One of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. I think it should be noted that Two-thirds of the king's reign are emotional states. Peace and joy. You see anybody on Facebook that needs more peace and joy in their life? Pretty much every single one of us. And God is saying, hey, how will you know that you were walking with me, that you were fixed on my sight? Oh, the primary emotions of my kingdom and of your life and of my life in this church will be peace and joy. And the first adjective of God's kingdom is righteousness, free gift. We cannot earn it. We are given. It is something that is given to us, right? He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness in Christ Jesus. Believer, you are hidden in Jesus today. You cannot make him love you any more than he already does. Now he's just going to help you become more like him. So those are the three states emotionally that we should be living our life. So, so how do we stay there? Is it in the effort of Timmy Riggs, no, we would all fail day one. The kingdom of God is about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way, what do you mean serve, what, what is there to do? Just to be in the Holy Spirit. That's how you serve Christ. You're pleasing to God and you receive human approval. When we say things like, hey, they're just gonna see that you're different, they're gonna see that, that your life uh, is more free and is more light and more full, of peace and joy, like, that's true. People are gonna notice. And there will be great opportunities for you because of that. But our hope and our focus is that they can also live that type of life and encounter Jesus. And so that is just good news. Pastor Scott, you can come back out, tickle the ivories. Uh, I got one more for you. I'm giving out verses like T-shirts at a Thunder game. Hebrews 12, one through two. Paul's talking to his church and uh, he's saying, look, there's been people who've gone before you and they've lived by faith and God has done amazing things in their life. Do not forget them. They recognize that their position of grace was, they didn't have to earn it, wasn't based on their performance. He's already looking in your direction, friend. All you have to do is just sit there in his gaze. And he says, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off Everything that hinders us, all the self-effort, all the self-power, all the self-pride, let's throw it off, and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. We've been given a race. We have a position. How do we do this, Paul? We fix our eyes on Jesus. We fix our eyes on Jesus, for he is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Other translations say he is uh, the author and the finisher of our faith. Either way you want to put it, he starts it and he finishes it. He who's began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. That's exactly what the word perfecter means. It's not about you being perfect. It's about just staying in the one who is and he's going to make you whole and he's going to make you complete. We fix our eyes on Jesus. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
Now, this is all good, but we still might get an image in our mind that, okay, it is God, he's gonna do it. So now we're thinking, oh, God is up there frantic. He's up there looking at all the, the you know, beepers and the buttons and the screens, and he's thinking, oh my gosh, did you see what happened over here? I, that one caught me by surprise. I didn't expect it. Gabriel, come on, you're gonna do overtime tonight. Like, no, no, no. Jesus says that, or Paul says that he is just sitting down. What's the posture of sitting down? One of rest, one of completion. He's echoing the words that he said on the cross. It is finished. My job and your job as Christians, it's not about me leaning into my own effort. It's about recognizing that no matter where I'm at in life, Jesus has his eyes in my direction. How do we remind ourselves of that so we can stay in a position? We sing songs about him. We read scripture. We go to coffee with friends and talk about Jesus. We do whatever we can to get our mind fixed on the mindset of, man, Jesus is thinking about me. He loves me. And I just wanna be in that. Here's my closing story. Uh, I don't have football glory days, but I am talking a lot about football today. In high school, we're playing the rival team and I throw a pass and it's a pretty good one. And uh, it gets intercepted. Guy catches it with one hand. I was like, oh, come on. Made the guy's highlight reel, you know. And I'm running back to the, to the side and the coach is, you know, doing what coaches do. He's, he's, wow, why'd you do that? You gator armed it, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I don't know, man. And all of a sudden I hear, hey, Tim. It's my dad's voice. It's deep. I didn't get that. So I look up and he says, I know it's to the wrong team, but that was your prettiest ball of the night. I see both my parents just grinning, you know? And I was like, man, that is unforced. That's just some parents being absolutely proud of their kid, man. Highs and lows, it doesn't matter. And I'm here today to tell you, what if you knew? And what would your life look like if you knew that was the face of your heavenly father in your direction forever and ever? Just flat out in love with you. And all he's asking us to do is be positioned in his gaze. God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. The beauty is, is when we look at you and you begin to transform us, you're saying now, hey, look at the people around you. And so we talk about this idea that, hey, uh, oh, Jesus, other people might come to know Jesus through us. Like, that's it. It's not because of, of all the good deeds we're trying to do to impress them. It's just, it just flows out of us. The fact that we just spend time with you and get to be with you, you begin to transform us. And so I just ask today, no matter what, even if it's not even about that, if there's someone in here that needs to be absolutely reminded and held up in your love today, and that there is not a single ounce of effort that they can do more for you to love them, let them feel that in such a real way. We thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I got 
this one through with my arms stretched wide. Lord, I worship you. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king. So, Lord, this morning, we leave this place filled with grateful hearts for all that you have done for us and all that you continue to do. And out of the overflow of thankfulness that we have, may we share your goodness and your grace and your mercy with everyone we come in contact with this week. May we bring light into the darkness. And in your name, we do all these things. And we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.